Good morning, everyone. Happy new month. What the last month of the year? Um, we all made it. Thanks be to God. Um, so today, looking at major poetry traditions. Major poetry traditions. Major poetry tradition. That is our topic for today. In looking at major poetry tradition, we will examine one classical poetry tradition, classical poetry tradition, classical poetry tradition, two, medieval poetry tradition, medieval, medieval poetry tradition, M-E-D-I-E-V-A-L, Medieval Poetry Tradition. Three. Renaissance Poetry Tradition. Renaissance Poetry Tradition. Renaissance Poetry Tradition. Four, metaphysical poetry tradition. Metaphysical, metaphysical poetry tradition. Metaphysical poetry tradition. What's the next number? Five, neoclassical poetry tradition, neoclassical, neoclassical poetry tradition, N-E-O-C-L-A-S-S-I-C-A-L, -S -S neoclassical poetry tradition, neoclassical. What's the next number? Romantic poetry tradition. Romantic poetry tradition. Romantic poetry tradition. And what's the next number? We we'll look at modernist poetry tradition. Modernist. From modern, you have modernist. Poetry tradition, modernist poetry tradition, modernist poetry tradition. So as you can see, it's going to be a long ride. So let us go back to the first one, which is, which is classical poetry tradition. It should be noted that when we talk about poetry tradition, we are referring to the convention, the rules, that characterize the poetry of a particular era or time. We talk about poetry tra tradition. We are referring to the conventions 
or the rules or the principles that characterize and guide the poetry of a particular time or era. In that sense, it is seen that one poetry tradition might be different from another because each poetry tradition has unique or peculiar characteristics. One poetry tradition might be different from another because each poetry tradition has unique or peculiar characteristics so distinctive that they set them apart from the other tradition. So in discussing poetry traditions, we are looking at the peculiar features found in the poetry of a particular epoch or era. And when we talk about poetry traditions, we are looking at the peculiar features, the distinctive features found in the poetry of a particular epoch or era, which set that poetry apart from the poetry of other eras. From the poetry of other eras. The poetry of other eras. Era is E R A. Uh, epoch is E P O C H. I talk about a particular time in history that's different from another um, time in history. So, classical poetry tradition then refers to the Poetry conventions practiced in the classical period. The poetry conventions that were practiced in the classical period. Classical poetry tradition then refers to the conventions of poetry practiced in the classical period. And when we talk about the classical period, when we talk about the classical period, we are referring to the Greco-Roman era. We are referring to the Greco-Roman era. The Greco-Roman era. Referring to the Greco-Roman era. G. R E C O hyphen R O M A N the Greco Roman era. It means the era of the Greeks and the Romans. The era of the Greeks and the Romans. The Greco Roman era refers to the era of the Greeks the Greeks and the Romans. Greco, G-R-E-C-O, G-R-E-C-O, hyphen, Roman, R-O-M-A-N, the Greco-Roman era, the era of the Greeks 
and the Romans. And it specifically refers to the 5th and the 4th centuries BC. It specifically refers to the, to the 5th and the 4th centuries BC. A time considered to be a golden age, an age of perfection. Time considered to be a golden age, an age of perfection. Because everything classical is about perfection. Everything classical is about perfection. If we say that a particular thing is a classic, it means that it is the best of its kind. If we say that a work is a classic, uh, a work is classic or classical, it, refers, it means that it is the best of its kind. So we'll talk about the classical period as we proceed and mature in the department. But one thing that you must note is that the classical period is usually denoted for its striving, for its striving for perfection in all areas of life. In fact, the modern world owes its development, much of its development, to the ancients. And by the ancients, we refer to the writers and intellectuals that existed in the classical period. Because almost all the disciplines that we know today can trace their origin back to the time of the Greeks and the Romans. It was then that the best, everything existed in its best, in its perfect state. And so the major type of poetry practiced in the classical period was the epic. The major poetry, the major type of poetry practiced in the classical period was the epic. Which we have defined in our previous classes as a long narrative poem written in an elevated style with flowery language, with refined language, and used to praise heroic deeds. A good example of an epic that was practiced in the classical period is the Iliad. Is the Iliad by Homer is the Iliad by Homer. The Iliad by Homer. Homer is spelled H O M E R. Homer. The Iliad. Okay. I L I a D, the Iliad. It is an epic poem that is based on the Trojan War. It is an epic poem that is based on the Trojan, Trojan War. The Trojan War. 
Trojan. T R O J A N. The Trojan War was fought in and around the city of Troy over the elopement. Over the elopement, the Trojan War was fought in and around the city of Troy over the elopement of over the elopement. Over the elopement of over the elopement of parish and over the elopement of Helen with parish P A R I S one of the princes of Troy. So the war was fought over a woman said to be the most beautiful woman ever. So the Greek city states came together to sack Troy because of Helen. Ironically, she is known as Helen of Troy. The epic has the epic has a sequel. The epic has a sequel. The Iliad has a sequel. The Iliad has a sequel. S E Q U E L has a sequel entitled That's another part of the story, the continuation. That's what we mean by sequel, right? Another part of the story, continuation of the story. So the Iliad has a sequel, has a continuation, right? Entitled The Odyssey. The Odyssey, spelled O D Y double S E Y. The Odyssey. The Odyssey. Still by the same author, Homer. So that while, so that while the, while the Iliad deals with the events of the war. The Odyssey deals with the tragic return journey of Odysseus, one of the heroes of the Trojan War. The Odyssey deals with the tragic story of Odysseus, one of the heroes of the Trojan War, while he was returning home from the war. All right? Odysseus is spelled O D Y double S E U S. Odysseus. The Odyssey is a tragic story of Odysseus while returning home from the Trojan War. Another type of poetry practiced in the classical period is pastoral poetry. It's pastoral poetry. That type of poetry practiced another type of poetry practiced in the classical period is pastoral poetry, which usually depicts shepherds in a rural environment, a countryside, which usually depicts shepherds 
in a rural environment or countryside. Taking care of the sheep. Taking care of the sheep. Taking care of the sheep. Among other activities. Now, it is important to note the differences between the, the differences between the epic and the pastoral poetry. It's important to note the differences that exist between the epic and the pastoral poetry. One is the actions of heroes, the actions of great men, the actions of highly placed members of society, whereas the pastoral poetry usually deals with people of humble background. People of humble background. Common people, lowly placed people. whose only job is to care for their ship. Whose only job is to care for their ship. Another difference is that, another difference is that The epic has the epic has both a cosmopolitan and metropolitan setting, both a cosmopolitan and metropolitan setting. The epic has both a cosmopolitan and a metropolitan setting. Whereas the pastoral poetry is set in a countryside, in a rural surrounding, in a rustic environment, villages, in villages, especially interior villages, right? Set in the countryside. So the epic has a cosmopolitan setting because whatever happens in it tends to happen everywhere in the universe. The events in the epic usually affect everywhere in the universe. It is metropolitan because it has, um, usually has an urban setting. It usually has an urban setting. The epic usually has an urban setting. So that is, those are the differences. Another difference is in the length. The length. The epic is by far The longest type of poetry. So the epic is longer than pastoral poetry. Epic tends to be longer than the pastoral poetry. As we, have, as we said in our previous classes, the epic is usually organized in books and cantos. And usually run into thousands of lines. 
usually run into thousands of lines. The epic usually organized in books and cantos. And usually run into thousands of lines. Even though the pastoral poetry could be arranged in books, even though the pastoral poetry could be arranged in books, they would not be as lengthy as the epic. They would not be as lengthy as the epic. For instance, it should be noted that the Iliad has over 15,000 lines. It should be noted that the Iliad has over 15,000 lines. That is how lengthy the epic could get. That's how lengthy the epic will get. I would also like to draw your attention to the existence of a type of poetry known as pastoral elegy. I'd also like to draw your attention to the existence of a type of poetry known as um, pastoral elegy. Pastoral elegy. Which was also practiced in the classical period. It was also practiced in the classical period. The pastoral elegy combines the features of an elegy and pastoral poetry. The pastoral elegy combines the features of the elegy and pastoral poetry. And it usually mourns the demise of a shepherd. And it usually mourns the demise of a shepherd. It mourns the demise of a shepherd, the death of a shepherd. Usually mourns the demise of a shepherd or the death of a shepherd. In the Greek tradition, in the Greek tradition, the pastoral poetry was known as the bucolics. In the, Greek, in the Greek tradition, the pastoral poetry was known as the bucolics. The bucolics. B U C O L I C. The bucolics. As practiced by the poet Theocritus. As practiced by the poet Theocritus. Theocritus. T-H-E-O-C-R-I-T-U-S. Theocritus. As practiced by the poet Theocritus. In the Roman tradition, in the Roman tradition, the pastoral poetry was known as the eclogues. Were known as the eclogues. Were known as the eclogues. Spelled E C L O G U E. E C L O G U E S eclogues. In the Roman tradition, pastoral poetry was known as the eclogues. As practiced by Virgil. 
as practiced by Virgil, the Roman poet Virgil, as practiced by the Roman poet Virgil, V I R G I L, V I R G I L, Virgil, V I R. V I R G I L Virgil, as practiced by the Roman poet Virgil. Right? So, so the popular, the popular uh, pastoral tradition in the classical period were the bucolics and the clogs. With the bucolics and the clogs. The popular pastoral poetry tradition in the classical periods where the bucolics and the eclore. So this, this poems, this poems depicts shepherds, humble shepherds, as it were, in natural environments. And technically and stylistically, they were said to be humbler or simpler compared to the epics. Technically and stylistically, they were said to be humbler and simpler than the epic, which explained why Some writers did begin the poetry career with the pastoral poetry. They start with the pastoral poetry to show their humble beginnings. All right? To show their humility. To show their humility and to demonstrate the, the willingness to start small. Some writers usually began the poetry career by, by starting with the pastoral poetry. They started writing with the as um starting they started writing the pastoral poems first as a way of demonstrating their willingness to start small before they graduated, before they graduated to writing the epic. Some writers began their poetry career by writing the pastoral poetry as a way of demonstrating their willingness to start small. The way of demonstrating the ability to start small. And then they would move on to write the epic poetry, which was a higher art. Which was a higher art. So, another difference then between the epic and the pastoral poetry would be that, and that difference then between the epic and the pastoral poetry would be that, that the epic usually demonstrates the greatness of a writer. The epic usually demonstrates the greatness of a writer and the apex of his poetic attainment. 
the epic usually demonstrates the greatness of the writer and the fact that he has attained the height of his poetry career. And the fact that he has attained the height of his poetry career. Whereas, pastoral poetry marks the humble beginning of the poet or the writer. All right, so we move on to the medieval poetry tradition. <coughs> medieval poetry tradition. The medieval poetry tradition. The medieval period followed the classical period. The medieval period followed the classical period. The medieval period followed the classical period. It is said to have begun It is said to have begun around 500 AD and lasted till and lasted till 4, 1400 AD. Lasted till 1400 AD. That's the 15th century. Is said to have begun in 500 AD and lasted till 1400 AD. The major characteristic of the medieval period the major characteristic of the medieval period is the dominance of religion. Is the dominance of religion or religious dominance. Because religious principles and practices regulated people's lives. Religious principles and practices regulated people's lives. Religious principles and practices regulated people's lives. Another name, another epithet, another name or another epithet, another epithet used to describe the medieval period is the Dark Ages. The Dark Ages. It can also be called, can also be called the Middle Ages. It can also be called the Middle Ages called the Dark Ages, and also be called the Middle Ages. It is called the Dark Ages because the, medi the medieval period lacked, the medieval period lacked the enlightenment associated with the classical period because of the breakup in the Roman Empire. 
It is called the Dark Ages because the medieval period lacked the enlightenment usually associated with the classical period because of the crack, the breakup in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was divided into two, the West and the East. <coughs> And this resulted in the loss of the light of enlightenment and secularism usually associated with the classical period. So this explains why the medieval period is really known as the Dark Ages because it lacked that touch of enlightenment. It lacked that touch of enlightenment usually associated with the classical period. In the medieval period, the church, the church regulated people's lives. In the medieval period, the church regulated people's lives. The church regulated people's lives. And by the church, we mean the Roman Catholic Church, because it was the only church at the time. So people's lives revolved around religion, whether of Christianity or of pagan origins, whether of Christianity or pagan origins. An important characteristic of medieval literature was the introduction of allegorical interpretation, was the introduction of allegorical interpretation to literature. An important characteristic of medieval literature was the introduction of allegorical interpretation from allegory. You have allegorical, A double L E G O R I C A L, allegorical interpretation to literature. Before now, Allegorical interpretation was used to study the Bible. Allegorical interpretation was only applied to the scriptures. And by allegorical interpretation, we mean the idea of understanding a text at two levels of meaning. By allegorical interpretation, we refer to the idea of understanding a text at two levels of meaning. By allegorical interpretation, we refer to the idea of understanding a text at two levels of meaning. The surface level and the deep level of meaning. The surface level and the deep level of meaning. The surface level, surface, S-U-R-F-S-E, surface level, and the deep level of meaning.
ok? In terms of poetry, romances were the popular types of poetry in the medieval period. Romances were the popular romances were the popular types of poetry in the medieval period. So when we talk about poetry in the medieval period, what should come to your mind is romance. What should come to your mind is romance. Because it was the most popular type of poetry in the period, in that period. Romance combines adventure, adventure with Moral lessons drawn from life and Christian teaching. It is a poem full of it's a poem full of adventurous events that delight the reader, but they also teach lessons at the end of the day. It's a poem that combines, that has um, adventurous, adventurous events, but at the end, but they are at the end, teaches lessons in human virtues, lessons in honesty and other forms of righteous living. A good example of romance associated with the medieval period is the anonymous poem is the anonymous poem entitled Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Sir, S I R. Gawain is spelled G A W A I N. So Gawain and the Green Knight. Knight is spelled K N I G H T, the Green Knight. The poem is about a knight. The poem is about a knight whose morality was tested. The poem was about a knight whose morality was tested. The poem is about a knight whose morality was tested through a series of events. Beginning from when the Green Knight arrives at the court of King Arthur. Beginning from when the Green Knight arrives at the court of King Arthur. And challenges, and challenges the soldiers there 
to a competition. For instance, the Green Knight, the Green Knight asked one of the soldiers, one of the knights brave enough to cut off his head in one blow. To cut off his head in one blow, but on the condition that after a year and a day, he will also cut off the head of that soldier. At first, the suggestion seems stupid because how would you, how would you cut off someone's head after yours had been cut off? You were supposed to die, all right? The Green Knight poses a challenge to the soldiers at King Arthur's court, asking one of them to cut off his head. But on the condition that after a year and a day, he would also cut off the head of that soldier at a time and a place that he would name. And I said, at first suggestion, it seems nonsensical because how would the knight live to cut off the head of this person after he must have died? So when this challenge is accepted, when this challenge is accepted by Sir Gawain, when this challenge is accepted by Sir Gawain, the Green Knight bends for Sir Gawain to cut off his head, which he does with one blow. Cuts off the Green Knight head with one blow. But amazingly, the Green Knight walks to where his head is, picks it up, and places it back on his head. And then tells the Green Knight to meet him at a particular place after one year and a day. And they major part of the poem consists of the journey that Sir Gawain undertakes to meet the Green Knight. Major part of the poem consists of the journey that Sir Gawain undertakes to meet the Green Knight. To accept the challenge because he must keep to his word. Because as a knight, as a knight, the code of knighthood, the code of knighthood does not only consist, the code of knighthood does not only consist in physical bravery, the code of knighthood most importantly consists in moral bravery. So he has to keep to his word. And he has to meet the Green Knight. So in the course of the journey, the Green Knight is put through tests. And in the end, it is found that 
he has not lived up to expectation. Which is his greatest shame? And not at the fact that at the last moment, when the Green Knight wants to cut his head, he flinches, showing an, um, an instance of physical cowardice. So at the end of the day, Sagawan realizes that he has not only failed as a soldier physically, in terms of physical bravery, he has also failed morally. He has also failed in terms of morality because the various tests that he was put through, he could not pass them. And so he has to, he has to come back. He has to realize the need to openly confess his sins and acknowledge them in order to gain forgiveness. So that at the end of the day, the story that we are told in the Green Knight has two levels of meaning. The first level is the need. The first level is the need. The first level talks about physical bravery of a soldier. And then the second level draws from the first level to talk to us about the principles of um, Christian salvation. Because in the end, the Green Knight is, just, is not just a myst any mysterious figure. The Green Knight could represent um, Christ himself. So you do not read the story at only at one level. You must read it allegorically as, consi as consisting of two levels of meaning expected of any medieval point. Renaissance poetry tradition. Renaissance poetry tradition. Renaissance poetry tradition. After the medieval period came the Renaissance period. After the medieval period came the Renaissance period. which began in the 16th century. The Renaissance began in the 16th century. That is 1500. You know, in the 16th century, that is 1500. The term Renaissance means rebirth. 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 Rebirth. R E B I R T H. R E B I R T H. Rebirth. And it implies. It implies or it denotes rebirth in classical learning. It, it means rebirth in classical learning. It means rebirth in classical learning.
in the Renaissance, the Renaissance, classical literature was discovered and studied. Classical texts were discovered and studied. The Renaissance, classical literature, classical texts were discovered and studied. The Renaissance, classical literature were discovered and classical authors were discovered and studied. There was a renewed interest. There was a renewed interest in classical literature, classical philosophy, classical text. There was a renewed interest in classical literature, in classical text. So in this period, English writers were deeply interested in the works of the Greeks and the Romans, which they studied and modeled themselves after, which they studied and modeled themselves after. Most of these works were translated. Most of these classical works were translated. Most of these classical works were translated into English and made available to writers and scholars. So it is this reawakening of interest in the texts, philosophies of the ancient Greeks and Romans that we refer to as the Renaissance. It is a cultural reawakening that took place, the cultural reawakening that took place in the 16th century. It is this revival of interest in the works of the Greeks and the Romans that we call the Renaissance. This cultural reawakening took place in the 16th century. By this, it would be then understood why the Renaissance writers wrote the same genres of poetry that the classical writers wrote. It would then be understood why the Renaissance writers wrote the same genres of poetry that the classical writers wrote. The classical writers wrote. Because they were looking up to the classical writers. They were studying them. So they wrote like them. The types of poetry practiced in the Renaissance period The types of poetry practiced in the Renaissance period, the types of poetry practiced in the Renaissance period include the epic, pastoral, pastoral elegy, mask, and the sonnet. Epic pastoral poetry, pastoral elegy, mask, M A S Q U E, and the sonnet, mask and the sonnet, 
mask and the sonnet. to the Renaissance period because of its importance to the Renaissance period. And in doing so, we would like to, if you have your material, read one of the sonnets, or just one or two, and use that to exemplify the sonnet convention. of the Renaissance period. As earlier discussed, when we were talking about the sonnet. So if you have the text, you could turn to page one, two, three, four, Five, six, seven, eight, where you have Sonnet 116. Let me not to the marriage of true minds. In our earlier class, we had said you should come to class with your text so that you could read along with us. We will study this poem and perhaps to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. Love is not love which alters when its alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it's an ever fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. The star to every wandering bar whose words unknown though its height be taken. Love not time's pool, though rosy lips and cheeks within its bending circles come past come. Love alters not with the brief eyes and wits, but bears it even to the age of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I ne'er read nor no man ever loved. So that is the point. And recall that we had said, recall that we had said, recall that we had said that the sonnets, first of all, is a poem of 14 lines written in iambic pentameter. So we are going to prove that now, to begin with. So you look at the poem, all right? Um, count the number of lines. Count the number of lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Correct. The sonnet is a poem of 14 lines, okay? Written in an in a iambic pentameter. Iambic pentameter, as, I, as we explained in that class, you could, ex you could understand it by taking the terms um, individually. First, I am. Uh, I am is a verse foot, all right? Described in terms of having a pattern of um, first an unstressed syllable followed by a stressed syllable, okay? And 
each of that set, stress and unstress, occurring five times in a line makes it pentameter. If it occurs once in a line, that's monometer. If it occurs twice, that's diameter. If it occurs three times, that's trimeter. If it occurs four times, that's tetrameter. If it occurs five times, that's pentameter. If it occurs six times, that's hexameter. If it occurs seven times, that's heptameter. And if it occurs eight times, that's octameter. And that is the largest that you could have in modern poetry. Okay? And if you scan the lines of the poem for the unstressed and unstressed syllable, you will see that this, the pattern for this poem is unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed till the end of the line. For all the lines, on stress syllable followed by a stress syllable, that's the rhythm of the poem. Let me know to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. Okay? Now, we had also said that the major subject matter of the sonnet is love. The major subject matter of the sonnet is love. All right? Um, just reading the poem, a few lines of the poem suggests that its major subject matter is what? It's love. Okay? Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. Love is not love, which alters when its alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. So the subject matter of the poem is love. Okay? Love. As fitting the sonnet, like we normally um, talk about. So, um, the poem is trying to um, segregate um, true love and the one that is not genuine. And the idea that, and the idea that marriage itself might not imply true love, okay? The love discussed in this poem is the one that is timeless and universal. The one that endures, is the poem is trying to define love for us, the meaning of true love. True love is unchangeable, it's unchanging, it's constant. You read the poem, that is what it says. Love is not love which alters when it's alteration fine. Nothing can change. Or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no. It's an ever fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. So that constancy, that sense of constancy, is what we associate with love that is true. Okay? And we see love then or genuine love as that which the vagaries of time cannot change. Or one which the storms of life cannot alter. If it remains constant, if, if it is unchanging, then um, it is true love. All right? Now, we have... Um, use some lines to justify the fact that the major subject matter of this poem is love as fitting the sonnet. Now we want to look at the rhyme scheme of the poem so that we can use it to infer the structural organization of the poem. Remember, remember this sonnet 116, sonnet 116, 116 is by William Shakespeare, all right? The poem is by William Shakespeare, and he wrote 154 of them. This is the number 116. This is the number 116, okay? And we, 
when we were talking about the Sunday, we said that it, it had a different structural organization um, compared to the Italian Sunday, right? Yes. So who could remind us of the uh, structure of the English Sonnet without referring to the notes? Who could remind us of the structure of the English Sonnet without referring to the notes? Okay? So, the English Sonnet is organized in three quatrains and a couplet. In three quatrains and a couplet. In three quatrains and a couplet. That means we have um, four lines in three places. Four lines in three places, followed by the last two lines. Four lines in three places gives you 12 lines, followed by the last two lines, making it 14 lines. Three quatrains and a couplet. That is the structural organization of the English sonnet. And it has a unique rhyme scheme. It has a unique rhyme scheme, which is a, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Okay, so now we, let's just go back to the poem and see whether we have that. The first line, when you are determining the rhyme scheme of a poem, the first line is usually A. And then if the next line has the same sound, then you repeat the A. If not, you move to the next letter, which is B and so on and so forth. So, the first line, mind, is what? A. Love is different, so it's what? B. Finds rhymes with mind, so it's what? A. Then remove rhymes with love, that makes it what? B. Then we have ma, which is C. And then we have shaken, which is D. Then we have ba, which rhymes with ma, which makes it C. And we have taken, which rhymes with shaken, which makes it what? D. So you have C, D. So you write it as we go, right? Just write it by the side of the word as we go, right? Then we have chicks, which is D. Then we have um, E, chicks, which is E. And then we have cam, which is F. We have wicks, which rhyme with chicks? E. And then we have doom. Rhymes with come, yes. F. Then we have proved and loved, G. G, G. All right. So you get that. So when you've got the rhyme, the one that the first one. The one you have, A, B, A, B, gives you the first quatrain, right? This is the first quatrain. Then, um, C, D, C, D gives you the second quatrain. E, F, E, F gives you the third quatrain. Then, G, G gives the final couplet, all right? This is the final couplet. Now, the structural organization of the poem usually shows how the ideas in the poem are usually organized. The subject matter of the poem in the English sonnet is discussed in the quatrains. The subject matter of the poem is discussed in the quatrains, right? And then it is concluded in the couplet. Please take note of that. The subject matter of the poem is discussed in the quatrains and then concluded in the couplet. All right? And please note that 
the conclusion, the conclusion is usually, <coughs> excuse me, creative and imaginative, witty and abrupt. It brings the point to a creative, imaginative, witty and abrupt ending. Okay. <laughs> so let us look at the poem to see some of its um, tropes. Look at the poem to see some of its tropes. For instance, in the in the second line we have Sishwara. The second line of the poem we have what we call Sishwara. Sishwara. The second line of the poem we have what we call Sishwara. Sishwara is spelled C A E S U R A. C A E S U R A. Sishwara. Sishwara. It refers to a pause near the middle or in the middle of a line of a poem. Sishwara refers to a pause near the middle or in the middle of a line of a poem. Normally, a poem is supposed to run from the beginning to the end. But sometimes, for, for literary effects, the poet might decide to introduce a pause in the middle of the line of the poem. So if you check the second line, you will notice the Sishwara. It is the full stop after impediment. It is the full stop after impediment. That's where you have the Sishwara. All right? A pause near the middle of a line of, near the middle, or in the middle of a line of a poem is Sishwara. It causes a break in thought. It causes a break in thought before another idea is introduced in the same line of the poem. All right? It's like saying stop and think or wait for it. The situation is like saying stop and think or wait for it. All right? Then we have repetition in the poem. We have an instance of repetition in the poem. Sin in love is not love. Love is a repetent in the poem. Love is what? A repetent in the poem. That which is repeated. That which is repeated in the poem is called a repetent. R-E-P-E-T-E-N-D. Repetent. So love is repeated in the poem. Love is also personified in the poem. So love, so then you also have personification as one of the figures of speech in the poem. Also have personification as one of the figures of speech in the poem. Okay? Then another another um, trope we have in the poem is the Exclamation in oh no. All right? Oh no. It's an ever fixed mark that looks on tempest and is never shaken. That runs the idea of um, personification and constancy of love in the poem. That looks on tempest and is never shaken. Sees love as a person, okay? That is brave. Refuse to shift despite difficulties. And then it is the star to every wandering bar. That is a metaphor. Love is com com uh, compared directly to a star. So that is a metaphor. So you have metaphor in that expression. It is the star to every wandering bar. Bar there refers to a boat, a canoe in the sea. All right? It's a star to every wandering bar. So love is compared to a star. That makes it that line um, to have the trope of metaphor. 
All right? Whose word are known, although his heart be taken. Love not times fool. Blow rosy lips and cheeks, when its bending single compass come. Love alters not with the brief eyes and wicks. But base, but base give you alliteration. But base, but base, but base is an instance of alliteration because of rep repetition of the because of repetition of the voice, blah, 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 uh, sound. B, 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 in but and beige. All right? Best argument to the age of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never read, no, no man ever loved. So the persona is saying that that ideal love, timeless and universal love could be reflected in him and in what he writes. All right? In the last line of the poem, the persona is saying that this kind of love that we are talking about can be found in him and in his art, is in sonnets. He represents this ideal love because what, he, what he's saying is true. And so his art is also true. All right, we'll end the class here for today until we meet again. Good morning.